Hi, and welcome to the final event in our current series of Women Rock IT. Today, we will meet three amazing women who have harnessed the power of technology to make the world a better place. By being, being part of our live audience today, entitles you to free course enrolment into the introduction to the Internet of Things, introduction to cybersecurity, entrepreneurship, and Linux. Details relating to course enrolment have been placed in the chat window. I would like to welcome today over 800 students joining us from on campus from their academies in India and Cambodia. We would also like to welcome students joining us at our Cisco offices in Sri Lanka and the Philippines. And finally, we'd like to welcome over 4,000 student, students joining us over our virtual platform today, Cisco TV. In the interest of time, we'd like to take any questions you have today for our guest speakers directly after the session. If you are joining us over the social media, you can post your question in a chat box or you can tweet your question to hashtag WomenRockIT. Thanks, and let's get started. I'd like to introduce today's guest speakers joining us. Jude Owa, who is the founder and CEO of Playmob. Rebecca Clements, Executive Manager of JAR Aerospace. Marla Kafami, Engineer at JAR Aerospace. But first, let's hear from Jude Owa, who is joining us today from our Cisco office in London. Welcome, Jude, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Emma, and yeah, really pleased to be here, and good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is Jude, and I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Playmob. Um, I am based in London, I'm originally from Scotland, and so I'll try my best not to speak really fast, because Scottish people usually do, and I'm very passionate about what we do as well, so I'll try my best to slow down. Um, so yeah, if we go into the first slide, um, I thought I'll give you a brief background of why I got into gaming. So as a as a child, I oh, come back there, noise. As a child, I grew up playing games. So um, consoles like the Commodore 64, Spectrum. Um, you know, we had all these old school gaming consoles at home, which uh, we used to play as a family. So for me. Gaming was really kind of, you know, family, social time. I played on a Friday night with my family. We played games like the popular um, Space Invaders, Pac-Man. Um, and, you know, for, for us as well, it's a, a really cost-effective form of entertainment and everyone could play. Um, so that really got me into gaming and thinking about technology. Um, my mum uh, was and still is really into technology, into um, science and, and physics and um, so I was really fascinated with not just playing a game, but how, how you can make a game. So if we go into the next slide. Um, so I, I used to make games as, as a kid, and I didn't, um, I didn't learn how to code as a child. Coding facilities weren't really available for, for children in the 80s. So what I used to do was make things like this, um, you know, kind of homemade games. Um, this isn't an example of what I created. This is probably better. Um, than what I was able to do. Um, but I used to make games where I can kind of learn about game mechanics and then test it out on my um, willing or not so willing family at the weekends. Um, but for me, this was, um, you know, it was a great way to kind of learn about how to build a game and, uh, and the function of a game and problem solving. Um, so if we go to the next slide, I attended a university in Scotland called Aberty. And Aberty were... Um, quite progressive when it came to entrepreneurship and, and tech. Um, they had one of the biggest games courses, um, well, the first games course in the world. It started in uh, 1997. Um, so you know, it was one of the first in the world, and now it's kind of best in class, where you can go and learn not just about gaming as a, uh, as a topic, but how you know, all the different uh, elements of gaming. Um, so I actually studied marketing. I did international marketing because um, I was really passionate about how how we market products. Um, but I met a team who were building games for education and for training. And uh, uh, it, within the university, there was an area called Embryonics where they grew startups. And the team that I met were actually building um, a company that were building games for corporate training and education. And they were looking for a marketing person. Um, and, and I was looking to do my dissertation. So I thought, this is a great win-win. You know, I get to write my dissertation um, and they get some marketing um, help and support and research in terms of where to take the business. 
and I completely fell in love with with what they were doing um, because you know for me as, as, as a gamer you know I grew up playing games as a child even as a teenager um, I would pretend to my friends that I was grounded um, just so I can stay in to play um, the next level of Sonic the Hedgehog and beat Dr. Robotnik um, so you know gaming was a big passion of mine and to be able to couple that with being able to learn um, was really fascinating to me um, so as I worked with them I also um, you know saw changes in people as they play games where they could learn I saw how it would engage people, how it would motivate them, and how they would learn so much more than just reading, you know, a, a thousand-page report or a document that was sent to them. Um, so, an example of some of the work that we did, or, or that I did um, with this startup, was um, working on multiplayer team-building games, where we can teach um, dispersed teams on how to work together as a team, um, and you know, other companies we worked with were like the likes of Shell. Um, IBM, um, BP, you know, looking at different ways you could apply gaming for um, health and safety, um, for internal training, for communication. Um, with Shell, what we did was we uh, worked on a whole order to cash um, game process where everybody in the company could see where they would fit in. Because um, games are great for cause and effect, to be able to see that if you don't take the order properly at the beginning, then at the end when you make the delivery, it can cost the company money if the address is wrong or the health and safety check isn't right. So you can imagine how that can come together as a game. Um, so if we go into the next slide, the other thing that I loved about gaming was um, just the size of the industry. Um, it, so in the kind of 90s, um, early 2000s or early 2000s when I was starting my career in gaming, uh, gaming was um, relatively small but growing quickly. Um, but right now, there's 2.1 billion people that play games globally. Um, and this number is growing at a phenomenal rate. Um, that's, right now, it's about 50% of the world's online population. Um, but, but in the next couple of years, by 2020, um, the re research says that 75% of the world's online population will be gaming. And that's really because of that more access to technology, more access to the internet. Um, and games are the number one thing that we do on our smartphones. Um, you know, when we've got five minutes here or there, we dip in and play a game. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, it's a, it's a, like I said, it's a fast-growing industry, um, but it's worth about $100 billion right now. Um, and again, th this number is growing at a phenomenal rate too. Um, globally, the whole industry is growing at about 8%. But some of the interesting areas for us are looking at kind of Africa and the Middle East, South America. Um, you know, where it's growing at about, um, well, Africa and the Middle East is one of the fastest growing regions, growing at, growing at 26%. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a huge industry, growing at a phenomenal rate um, and at a global scale. If we go into the next slide, um, so some of the age brackets of who gamers are, because when we think of gaming, we tend to think about children. Um, and this is, right now, you know, it's a myth because but the average age of a gamer is 35. Um, there's over 26% of gamers are over 50, which is, is, is huge. But the biggest portion of gamers are the millennials and Gen Z generations. Um, and right now, there's slightly more women playing games than men. So about 51% female, 49% um, uh, men. And again, this is because of access to mobile phones, social gaming. You know, it's not just about the teenage boy sat at home on his own playing war games. Games are now a social activity for everyone of all ages. So we go into the next slide. Um, so for me, being a woman in gaming, I didn't really kind of see that I was different. Um, I think gaming is a very inclusive industry. Um, it might seem like one of these industries that kind of sits in silo and it's quite difficult to break into. Um, but it's actually one of the most open and friendliest industries I've ever worked in. Um, and, but one of the biggest problems that we face right now as an industry is only 20% of the industry are women. So we need more women getting into the industry to help us make games for women. Because if we have more women playing games than men, then we need women designing games and making games that are going to be appealing for other women to play. So it is a problem right now. And you know, if anybody out there is interested in getting into gaming, I massively encourage you to, because it's one of the most exciting industries and so many opportunities 
um, you know, you've got a real opportunity to, to shape it with us. So if we go into the next slide. So I've, I've kind of spoken a little bit about my education and kind of getting into gaming. Um, and, and for me, I've, I've always been um, an entrepreneur. I've always been in the startup world. So when I worked at the startup when I was at university, um, I then went on to make uh, to create my own startup, which I then um, sold a few years later. Um, and then, so what led me to setting up Playmob was the the realization that we can couple gaming with impact. So I'd already looked at how we can couple gaming with education and training, and how we can change people's lives. But how can we do more of that? How can we really help people through gaming and bring our actions back into the real world? And if anybody is familiar with this game, Farmville, um, you know, one of my favourites for, for a while and still is, um, you know, Farmville really inspired me um, in, in about 2010. The, um, you know, if you're not familiar with Farmville, it's a social game where you uh, manage your virtual farm, you have your virtual tractors. It's a free-to-play game, but you buy items inside the game that help you progress or they're aesthetic. Um, so it's a really fun play, fun game to play. It started off on Facebook and then it moved on to mobile. Um, if you go to the next slide, but something that they did in 2010 really, really inspired me. So um, 2010 was the um, uh, the year that the, the the Haiti earthquake happened. It was a massive disaster, and uh, Farmville wanted to do something in order to respond to this disaster. So what they did was they launched an item that players can buy. Um, it was called a sweet seed. So you can buy this virtual seed for your virtual farm um, and plant it to grow your virtual crop. Um, but what they did was they gave a percentage of each seed sold um, back to victims, the, the money raised from the seed back to victims of the earthquake. So in five days, they raised about $1.5 million. Um, but they saw players so engaged. Um, they were sharing it on social media, telling their friends about it. Um, so as well as making a big impact, what they actually realised was that players wanted to make an impact together. Um, and, you know, it, it's a small action with millions of people taking part and made a big difference to people's lives who really needed help. So this really inspired me in terms of how gaming could be used as a powerful source of good, um, which is why I set up Playmob. And I'll talk a little bit about, bit about Playmob shortly. So if we go into the next slide. Um, so the, the Haiti example I gave you was from 2010 and over the past seven years um, I've been working in this space of gaming for impact and just last year the, an organisation called the Charities Aid Foundation brought out uh, um, a survey which showed that you know, gamers really want to make a difference and we believe this is because the biggest portion of gamers are millennials and Gen Z um, so you know, you're kind of looking at, at uh, teenagers um, right up to kind of 37 um, but actually all gamers want to make a difference it's a really easy way to make a difference um, you know you get to play have fun and change lives at the same time um, and I think the most powerful stat from this slide is that 87% of gamers feel that games are, are, are perfectly placed to make um, societal change so this is a really powerful statement um, and then gamers, you know, they, they want to make a purchase um, uh, that will give back to charity, but also interested to donate while they're playing. So there's a real momentum around gamers wanting to do good. We just need more opportunities presented to them to make a big difference. Um, and again, you know, another call out to um, everyone watching. If you are interested in gaming and you like the impact side, there are so many opportunities um, to do more good. You know, there's 2.1 billion people playing. Um, so there's there's tons that we can do to, to make a difference. So we go into the next slide. So I, I just thought I'd bring up more kind of general stats as well because it's not just happening in gaming. Um, you know, we're not just seeing, you know, people wanting to do good and it being good for business too. Just in gaming, this is also happening across the board in business. Um, so. Doing good is good for business. And if companies learn to weave impact into the day-to-day -day business for employees and for customers, um, it's not just good for those who are trying to help, but it's also good for their own businesses too. So on this slide, um, 
the statistic 133 percent comes from the Havas, um, who are a big global agency, and um, they do a study called the Havas Meaningful Brands Index. And every year they look at brands that are meaningful to their customers. Um, and every year the brands that are most meaningful outperform the stock market. So last year, meaningful brands were outperforming the stock market by 133%, which is phenomenal. So this proves that you know, if you can find interesting ways to weave doing good into daily business, it can make an impact and also um, impact the business too. Um, so like in gaming, if you buy an item or you take an action, it's weaved into the process of playing a game. Um, so going to the next slide. Um, and you know, we really believe this is, it, it's down to the millennials. It's down to millennials and Gen Z generations, um, the next generations coming through. So you know, millennials are, you know, they're very purpose driven. Um, they're, they're conscious consumers. They really think about the brands that they want to buy or interact with. And their spending power is big as well. Um, so they will put their dollar where they, um, where they know is going to make a double impact. So not only will they buy a product or service that they need or want, but they'll also make an impact on someone's life too. Um, and what we're seeing is customers switching brands for brands that are, are, are doing good. Um, so it is good for business. So you go to the next slide. Um, again, a few more statistics around why um, you know, consumers are searching for purpose and why this matters. But You've got companies like Diageo or Johnson and Johnson are, um, you know, they, they're really seeing the impact of, of you know, being more purpose driven and um, being led by the millennial generations to really make change. So if we go on to the next slide. So just a little bit about Playmob and what we do. So, so that gives a bit of history in terms of my academic experience and working with startups and, and gaming um, and impact. But how this all comes together and why I set up Playmob was because, you know, I wanted to see the 2.1 billion people playing games um, actually truly make a, a big difference. So what we do is we, uh, we connect meaningful brands to big audiences through games. Um, so we call our platform a values driven platform um, and we want to work with innovative brands who um, we were able to connect their purpose-driven stories through content within games um, to millions of gamers online. Um, so we work across a, multiple, a multitude of topics. Um, and we also cover the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and right now, you know, we've, we've worked on topics such as cyberbullying, um, protecting the oceans, water, um, cybersecurity, um, self-esteem. There's a number of issues that we can cover. So we'll work with the brands to create bits of content that we then feed into mobile games. And we do that through the ad networks. Um, and we do it in between levels. So we're not disrupting the gameplay. You know, we, that's the last thing we want to do. We want to make sure that gamers have a great experience. So imagine you're playing a game, you get to the end of a level, and um, one of our mini games will appear to teach you about oceans or plastics or self-esteem. Um, you play the mini game. And then you can play it again, you can share it, or you can just go back to playing the game that you were playing in the first place. Um, but what that's doing is it's really engaging people and planting the seeds in terms of the issues that we can change. Um, and then every time we play, we give a donation back to a charity that aligns with that topic so that players can see that not only are they learning and we're asking them to take action, so it might be to not use plastics, um, but also that we're impacting um, a project on the ground too. So that's how, that's how we work, and that's how we're combining impact and gaming at a global scale. So I've got just a few quick examples um, to show you. So we go into the next slide. Um, so this was a game that we created for, uh, well, a campaign that we created for the Global Goals last year. Um, so there's 17 goals, and it could be hard to remember them all and to remember what we can do for them all. So we created this little game where you can... Um, it's like a jigsaw. You can put the jigsaw back together and then at the end of the game, you then pick the goal that you're most passionate about and then you pick a pledge um, that people uh, that, that you want to do for that goal. Um, but this, was, this gave us really interesting insight as well in terms of what people would do for the global goals and uh, what they cared most about. Um, so in this case, um, you know, most people said that they, um, 
uh, they cared about uh, poverty, but actually they would take more action for hunger. Um, so we've been working with research companies to really understand what the data means behind the actions that players take, which is a really exciting um, opportunity for us as well, because when you're playing, it's subconscious data, and we can see you know, where are their gaps? What do people want to do? You know, what's most interesting for people to make change around? Um, so we're gathering up some really interesting research. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, so this was a game called uh, The Big Cat, and it was about plastic pollution. And in this little game, we had a, a um, the main character was a Bikita Poppus. Now, a Bikita Poppus, there's only 30 of them left in the world. So we had the Fikita Poppa swim through different oceans around the world to collect plastic pollution, to highlight the fact that there's um, different uh, plastic pollution problems in different parts of the world. And uh, what we did here was we uh, created this mini game and then distributed it through Rovio's network. So Rovio create Angry Birds. So um, last April, if you're an Angry Birds player, you might have seen this pop up and play. Um, now what we were also asking players to do was the more plastic they collected within the game, um, then the more uh, then we were going to un unlock the impact. So it was a community-driven goal, where the goal was to try and play and collect as much plastic as possible together. Um, now the goal here was to try and uh, collect a million virtual tanks of plastic from the ocean. And once we reached that goal, we then um, initiated a, an online, um, sort of a, a real-world plastic cleanup. Um, uh, which was in rivers in, in Europe. So players could see that the, the, the fact that they were just playing and learning um, was going to impact change on the ground for real. And then the pledge we asked players to take was to, to not use a straw because plastic straws are a, a, are a big issue. There's half a billion straws consumed daily in the US. Um, so it's a massive issue. And you know if every single person decided not to use a straw and we had less straws in the ocean, our oceans would be a lot cleaner. Um, so these tiny, small actions that we're asking people to do will make a big collective impact. Um, and that's what we're really passionate about. Um, now, this little game, just to give you some stats, so we reached about 7 million people, um, of which um, 3.5 million people played, um, which is a huge volume of people. Um, and although it was a game, you know, our games are small. We call them small but mighty. Um, so they're less than a minute long. And um, although it was less than a minute long, we had 7.4 years of playtime collectively. So the amount of time that people played the game together was 7.4 years. Um, this is across four weeks. So if we go into the next slide. So the next slide is uh, about a game called Island Nation Defence. And Island Nation Defence was about um, the sea levels rising. So if you think about the sea levels rising and we're on land and what can we do to stop the sea levels rising? So we can't stop it, but there's certain things we can do to try and slow it down or to make it um, uh, to make it not, you know, less of a bad situation. Um, so what we did is we created this game, which was like a, a, a sim type game. Um, so you had an island that you had to protect. You had to protect your island with mangroves. You had to build walls. You were protecting your family. Um, and every so often, the message would pop up to say, you know, sea levels are rising because of, um, because of global warming. And global warming is happening because of carbon emissions. So it's very simplified, but helps players understand, you know, that you know, we uh, emit carbon emissions every single day by switching on the lights, by driving our cars. So what actions can we take? to reduce those, to make this less of a problem. Um, so within the game, we asked them people to make a pledge. And pledges were switch off your lights, um, eat less uh, meat, or, or do car sharing. So number one is switch off your lights. I mean, that's an easy thing to do. You know, don't leave your lights on when you leave the house, if you don't need them. Um, that's a really easy thing to do. The second thing was car sharing, or you know, taking a bike to work. The last thing to do was um, eat meat. People like eating meat, but if we can stop it, if we can reduce our meat consumption, we'll um, emit less carbon emissions. Um, so again, this was a really popular little game. Um, we had uh, more than 50% of people playing. Again, it was about 7 million people again. 
Um, and it was a 40 second long game as well. Um, so if we go on to the next slide. This is uh, much more of a recent one that we did. Um, it's actually still going live now. Um, so you might have heard of um, Dumb Ways to Die, um, which was uh, you know, a really popular game, downloaded 200 million times, um, really fun, quirky, and it was to raise awareness of um, you know, how dumb it is to step on the train tracks, um, because that's a dumb way to die. So uh, we collaborated with the Dumb Ways to Die team to create Dumb Ways to Kill the Ocean. Um, so if you go to the URL Gaming, uh, uh, Gaming for the Oceans, uh, you'll be able to play the game there. You'll be able to see some stats um, from the game. If you go into the next slide, I'll just show you a quick, um, quick overview of this. Um, so this small but mighty game um, was distributed to 15 million people, um, which we're still distributing now. Um, National Geographic picked it up. Uh, we worked with Clear Channel, who are they do outdoor billboards, but we did the game on a massive billboard screen where people can walk up to it and play it. Um, and again, it was covering issues like um, polar ice caps mel melting, coral reef degradation, plastic pollution, um, in really kind of fun, quirky ways, but really raising awareness of, you know, that this is an issue and there's things that we can do to prevent it. Again, you can make a pledge you know, not use a plastic bag, do not use a plastic straw. Um, so yeah, if you play it, I guarantee it's a lot of fun. It's a, you know, it's a very small game, um, but our plans are to take this into, um, you know, multiple series because it was so much fun. Um, so we worked with the likes of um, Binga, um, who did uh, Farmville. They distributed it for us um, and a few other game studios too. Um, so if we go on to the next slide. Um, so just to finish up, so if anybody's interested in the space of gaming and impact, um, there's a, a researcher called Jay McGonagall who wrote a book called um, Reality is Broken. And in 2011, she brought out her book and it quoted at the time that we spend 3 billion hours per week playing games. Um, but if we were to reach 21 billion hours um, per week playing games, we could start to solve some of the world's greatest problems like climate change, obesity and poverty. Um, now that's in 2011. Right now we're at about 16 billion hours per week playing games, and this isn't the, this isn't us not going outdoors, um, and just sitting and playing computer games. This is more people having access to technology, so more people are playing, uh, and more ways to play as well. Um, so we're really get, getting close to a tipping point of where we can really start to make effective change. Um, but you're probably asking yourself, you know, why? How does 21 billion hours of gameplay link to solving all of these problems? Um, so how it works is, you know, game, gaming is a great way to tell stories. We can immerse people, we can inform them, we can engage them, we can inspire action. Um, and by leveraging gaming in a positive way, um, we could start bringing the 2.1 billion people who play games together <coughs> to take small actions to make a big impact. So this is where we start seeing the real change because it's about storytelling and then driving that action. Small daily actions on a daily basis collectively will make a huge impact. So that's why I'm so passionate about gaming for impact. And um, if we go into the next slide, that's me at the end of mine. But you know, I've put, put your handles there if anybody would like to um, to learn a bit more. And happy to share the links of the games as well. And yeah, thank you so much for listening. And I'll pass you back over to Emma. Thanks, Jude. And it was really great that you shared your journey with us. And it's great to see that gaming is coming to the rescue. I'm now a vegetarian. I just want to make that official. Um, there's so much that we need to solve, the plastic epidemic that we're going through right now. So really appreciate all that you're doing um, for our environment and for society through gaming. Um, what we will do now is hold questions for Jude until the end of today's session. Um, I would like to introduce our next two speakers uh, from JAR Aerospace. Rebecca Clements, who's our Executive Manager, and Marla Kafami, who's the Engineer at JAR Aerospace. But first, let's hear from Rebecca, who is joining us today here in our Sydney office. Welcome, ladies, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks, thanks so much, Emma. Um, so, as Emma said, we are from JAR Aerospace. Um, so, we were actually founded by four young entrepreneurs um, between the ages of 21 and 23. So, these gentlemen had uh, large goals, big ambitions. Um, and a real passion for new technology. So can I have my next slide, please? So we have the Chief Executive Officer, Jack Cullen. Sorry, next slide. 
Um, we've also got the operating officer, um, Sam Lewinson, the chief marketing officer, Lockie Burke, and our head of engineering, Dan Muscarit Tolo. So these founders, they believe that nothing was impossible. The goal was too large. Um, so could you please play the next video? So JAR is actually an Australian organisation. We're committed to igniting the Australian um, position in the aerospace industry. JAR was actually created um, some efficient platforms, configurable solutions and diverse unmanned aerial systems across multiple industries. We've done this through research, design and then the development of our actual drones. JAR aims to disrupt the aerospace industry by pushing technology boundaries um, tailoring the UAV or the UAS platforms to solve past, present, and then also our future problems for not only global, but also our customers. So we've been able to collaborate through the Australian industry, um, as well as through our global supply chain, which is actually bringing leading edge concepts and technologies and innovation to Australia. So JAR's goal is actually to be in space in the next five years. And through the technology that we've been able to develop with our drones, we're using this as a foundation for us to be able to reach our goal. Great. After entering the Australian aerospace industry, JAR realized that to redefine Australia's position globally, we must also expand education skills in Australia's next generation, especially in the unmanned aerial systems technology. This is where JAR education um, was born. Can we please play the next video? Our vision is to redefine the Australian aerospace industry. Critical to this endeavour is inspiring the young minds of today to be the future technologists of tomorrow. At JAR Education, we are committed to equipping this generation of students with the tools and know-how to practically apply their talents and reach new horizons. It gives me great pleasure to officially launch JAR Education and our drone integration program. Bringing theory and practice together in classrooms by focusing on the development of skills such as design, hardware, software, coding, robotics and automation. Um, I think it's massive. I think the possibilities are endless. I'm very proud to be involved with JAR Education. It's one of those things where um, you know it's helping, it's helping people, it's helping um, kids at school. To me it's very important um, to be involved with such a thing. And, yeah, to see the kids at the moment, you know, they've accomplished a lot at a young age and it's, it's really good to see. Basically, do what your mind tells you to do. Don't sort of limit what you can do by what you've got. I really think that it's important to just experiment. A lot of these types of things are very step-based and don't allow for much variation, but this particular project was really good in, in just giving the kits to us and working in a group, we could communicate and, and figure out what to do ourselves, which ultimately means we, we learn more from. While this was our pilot program, um, if we could go on to the next slide. Uh, we have run many workshops at girls' schools, as you can see in this slide. This is where we've been able to teach and watch the growth of the next generation's brightest minds. During this, we encourage to further their studies in IT and monitor the trends as we go. JAR Education has also been heavily involved in the universities around Sydney providing opportunities to the next brightest to come and work in the industry while they're still at university. So can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so a little bit about us and I guess how we came to JAW. Um, I've got a bit of a different background compared to a, say, an IT background. I started in business and marketing. But while I was at school, I was actually a very logical person. Um, I always asked the question why. I needed to know the logical reason behind doing something. Um, I was also never really involved in project-based learning. That wasn't something that existed while I was at school, um, which is great um, because we have actually been able to put this into JAR education at the moment. Um, so kids like me would have been inspired uh, to do a little bit more in STEM or science, maths, technology, um, if I had that opportunity. So I found it really hard to um, 
learn at school and go to university. It wasn't something I really saw myself doing. But as I grew up, um, I knew that I had to do something. And so at the time, I was teaching dancing to children. So it encouraged me to go to university and study teaching. So can I have the next slide, please. Within the first week of me actually going to uni, I decided that teaching wasn't for me. It's not something that I saw myself doing long term. Um, but from there, I then moved into psychology. And I really enjoyed the way the human brain worked. Um, and it, it intrigued me. But again, I didn't really want to be a psychologist. It wasn't something that I saw myself doing long term. So could I go to the next slide, please? Um, so I decided that it was time for me to travel. Um, I went to third world countries where I was able to work with underprivileged children. Um, I was able to work within leprosy villages as well. And it really kickstarted my passion for people and helping those who were less fortunate than I, than I was. Next slide, please. So from returning from my travels, I decided that a business degree was going to be what I wanted to do. Um, I majored in marketing and management, but it meant that I was able to keep a broad uh, options for what I wanted to do. I didn't have to be specific on what I was going to study or what I was going to end up doing one day. Um, from there, I still knew I wanted to work with people and learn more about communication. So I worked in sales for three years. Um, I learned more about human behavior, the communication, interaction, but I loved it. I really enjoyed it. And then from there, I was able to move into a events role. Um, I was able to look at how so events were socially impacting communities. Um, and I found that it was something I really knew I could push forward with. After working in my events role, I was actually poached um, from a defense contracting company where I was able to move over to America and work over there um, with this particular company. During this time, um, I actually started to really understand that there was more global problems and then there was more possibilities to fix them. So it drove my passion to then come back to Australia and uh, build the capabilities here and support solutions globally. So myself um, and Jack, the CEO of Gyrospace, are actually working together many years ago. And when he was looking at hiring people for JAR, he spoke to me about a startup that was passionate about new technology, helping people globally. So for me, how could I say no? We move to the next slide. Thanks. So currently, I'm the executive manager, um, which is, again, a very broad term for what I do. Um, I'm able to use my background in business, management, marketing, operations, sales, um, and put it into helping develop the business. While I don't have a technical background, um, I'm actually really privileged in working with some of the most intelligent people I've met of this generation. Um, I've learned that technology is in every area of business, and I really wish that I had project-based learning back when I was at school. And that would have encouraged me to potentially do it later on in life. Um, but one of those forward thinking engineers of, that I believe is one of the most intelligent of our time is Marla. So I'm going to hand her over um, so she can explain, I guess, where she came from and how we connected at JAR. Well, thank you, Beck, for the lovely introduction. Um, could we advance the next slide? Thank you. My life is a little, my life story is a little different from Beck's, but funnily enough, our love for solving problems brought us um, together at JAR Aerospace. I believe an engineer's true um, power is solving problems, and this makes all of us engineers of our own lives. Um, next slide, thank you. <clears throat> Growing up, um, I always had a love for space, and even though I was never the best at the sciences or, the, or at math, it didn't really get in my way for chasing my passion. What intrigued me about space was the unknown. Um, and I guess at school, I always found it too laid back and it didn't really work all that well for me. But luckily enough, I got accepted in the University of New South Wales here in Sydney. Um, and this is where I found my passion and my journey towards space. So a four-year degree in aerospace engineering not only got me a degree, it also provided me with the opportunity to meet like-minded people who wanted to solve real-world problems. Um, next slide, thanks. Um, at university, I was also one of the lucky ones to learn the art of humanitarian engineering. 
um, through a 14-day summit program in Cambodia with Engineers Without Borders. During the summit, I learned that a problem can be solved in multiple ways. However, the right solution depends on the recipient, their strengths, the environment, and the way of living. Next slide, thank you. I was also one of the lucky few to attend the International Astronautics Conference, where I met a current mentor of mine who works at Airbus in the UK. I saw Elon Musk's live presentation about his plans for, for Mars, along with many more heroes sharing about the large-scale world problems that they're solving today. Next slide, thank you. Another uh, amazing opportunity um, was getting to design my very own CubeSat at university. I studied all the necessary subsystems and their integration and designed a debris tracking satellite using a panchromatic optical payload. One final exciting project that I got to work on during university was modifying a police helicopter into a certifiable medical helicopter. Through this project, I got to work with aviation and medical industry experts solving real world problems. Ultimately, university provided me with a network of people who shared a similar passion to mine. It was then that I knew that I wanted to work with, in a company with people with heightened passion like mine. I got introduced to JAR Aerospace through a friend who is probably one of the most passionate and who opened the doors and introduced me to people like himself at JAR. That was about 10 months ago, and I can't believe that our passion has grown. We work together and solve problems every day, and it is a passion we share that it keeps us striving forward. Next slide, thank you. So I guess that's how Kamala and I came together to working at JAR um, with similar passions but very different backgrounds. So one of the things that drones are doing globally is helping solve problems such as efficiency, it's reducing expenses, um, but most importantly, it's reducing human risk. Um, JAR has actually created customized solutions for each of their clients. And We've designed and developed face drones or platforms um, that we can be interchangeable with sensors. So these sensors actually provide the solutions depending on the end user. So Marla's actually going to go through right now um, some of the JAR Aerospace drones, their capabilities, and a brief explanation about their jobs and what they're currently doing. So we could we go on to the next slide? Thank you. So um, this is Tachi. If we can play the video. Designed by our, by our head of engineering, Dan Moscaritolo, it is a lightweight drone. And when integrated with small sensors, we can solve problems in agriculture. Tachi is a special drone. It is a lightweight drone, which can be integrated with payloads. Now, let me define what a payload is. Payload can have multiple definitions in aviation. A payload of an aircraft is its carrying capacity. In telecommunication, the payload is the intended message that is transmitted. Great. Can we advance to the next slide? Thank you. Now, Tachi can support payloads up to 400 grams. However, currently, it has been equipped with a gimbal, which is a stabilizing event, um, stabilizing device, um, which prevents unwanted movements experienced during flight. Tachi um, all, can fly for 10 minutes and can perform in high-risk areas. It is very quick, relating it to its name, which means rapid and quick. It is also a scientific name for the echidna. Can we move on to the next slide? Thank you. Here is the Satonics. Um, some of you may know, Satonics is a scientific definition of a quokka, which is an Australian native animal. Designed by Patrick Munsey at JAR Aerospace, the Satonics is referred to as an all-in-one drone. It is a special drone as it can house sensors within its plastic cover, which goes here. <laughs> um, it has foldable arms, making its design perfect for easy transportation. Could we move on to the next slide? Thank you. Satonics 
is also a very lightweight drone and, uh, and can support sensors up to 300 grams. However, its flight time is much longer when compared to the Tachi, um, able to fly for 20 minutes. Um, could be, move on to the next slide, thank you. This is the Protodon, which is behind me. Um, the Protodon is our largest drone yet. It has six arms, 12 motors, two on each arm. It is a very powerful drone. Next slide, thank you. The number of motors mounted on the drone give rise to its ability to lift heavy payload weighing up to 30 kilograms. It has the longest fly time compared to the Tachi and the Satonics, able to fly for 35 minutes. Um, its flight time and payload capability make it a heavy lift drone powerful when solving problems in different industries um, for um, transport applications. These drones are some of the few that we have designed at JAR. With these platforms, we can solve problems in multiple industries. Um, Beck will now go through the top three industries of interest to us at JAR. So as I mentioned before, drones are actually working across multiple industries globally. Some of these can be agriculture, search and rescue, um, we've got mining, aid relief, entertainment, and many, many more. So the agriculture industry, for example, faces uh, climate change, which then affects quality and quantity of water. The farmers have a complex job of monitoring large areas of land. They need to access and manage their long-term crop growth, um, as well as be able to look at the variables that could damage their crops. In 2015, there was 1.5 billion hectares of the world's land surface being used in agriculture, and 27.3% of the world's population were actually working in this industry. So if we break this down, that's 2 million people globally as a workforce in the industry, or one farmer to 750 hectares. So for one person to manage such a large amount of land, you can imagine the challenges that they would have. Move to the next slide, please. So, if we now look at the mining industry, again, it covers. Sorry, next slide. Uh, it now covers large surfaces, but it's an added challenge of not being just above ground, below ground now as well, and then also offshore sea operations. So, key requirements for the mining industry is to be able to cover that large areas of land with a short time span being able to accurately collect real-time data. Um, so it is actually predicted in 2019 that just on new equipment alone, not including the current equipment that they have, there's going to be 104,000 million US dollars spent to buy that equipment. So for us at JAR, that's fantastic because it means there's millions of drones and capabilities that we'll be able to help out with and support that industry. Next slide, please. So another job uh, industry that you can work in is a helicopter or a small aircraft pilot. They provide surveillance, aid relief, search and rescue, and much more, but they all need to be a bird's eye view. So this can be in areas of low altitude, over mountaintops, um, and then also have variable weather conditions. This creates a high risk for the pilots in this particular industry. So if we look at using an unmanned aerial system where they can remotely pilot this, it removes that human risk. It increases the efficiency of it because you can have multiple drones. And also it reduces the cost. In Australia, a Coast Guard helicopter costs 680 million Australian dollars just for the helicopter and the maintenance over one year alone. So if we replace that with five drones, it's going to significantly reduce the costs for that industry. So these are just a few industries that we're currently globally working in. Um, I'm now going to hand back over to Marla, who's going to look at those drones that we have that she's previously explained and how they're providing solutions within each of these industries. Great. Can we play the next video? Thank you. Today in the agricultural industry, farmers must monitor large areas of land to identify the health and growth of their crops. This is a time intensive task, which is a big problem that farmers face today. Can we go on to the next slide? Thank you. 
Large areas of land can be monitored and sectioned off into manageable zones through the use of near-infrared cameras. Different types of crops can be distinguished from one another, making the analysis of the overall health for each individual crop a lot easier for the farmers. Next, sl next slide, thank you. Short-term analysis is not the answer for crop growth. We need to understand their health in a period of time. And these characteristics can be collected and stored for farmers to view over a long period of time using RGB cameras. Next slide, thank you. Visual evaluation of crops for understanding their health can be inaccurate. Um, this issue can be solved using thermal sensors. Um, these sensors collect radi uh, radiation data from crops, which indicate their soil mo moisture, temperature, and pH levels, as well as the soil nutrient levels. This rather tedious analysis of crop health is simplified through thermal sensors. Next, thank you. So these three, the near-infrared camera, RGB, and the thermal sensors are all very light payloads, which can be integrated onto platforms such as the Tachi um, to monitor crop health uh, over large areas of land over a long period of time. A good example for the use of this would be in the rice farms in Cambodia, or the Australian cotton farms. Could we play the next video? Thank you. In the mining industry, they face multiple problems which can be solved through drones. In the mining industry, people must access diverse spaces and platform um, and perform their analysis using instruments that are highly sensitive. The use of smart airframe design with specific sensors and the ability to store these remotely can solve issues faced in the mining industry. In this industry, miners must access a range of different spaces from mountains to caves and also considering offshore seas. Drones with smart airframe designs can be a lightweight and compact solution here. They can fit into small spaces and fly over tall hills over water, river, and seas. Drones can be an agile platform solving problems in diverse spaces. Next slide, thank you. Soil and rock composition is of the most importance in the mining industry. Hyperspectral sensors can take images collected across the electromagnetic spectrum. This is crucial in the mining industry for finding objects, identifying material or detecting their processes occurring in hard to reach and high risk areas. Next, thank you. When modeling the structure of a cave or mountainous zone, accurate data must be collected. Until today, modeling has not been very accurate. However, by using many sized single board computers with continuous spectral and spatial coverage, we, um, on board a drone, um, we can collect large data of, image, of images from rocks and mines. These can later be used to generate orthophotos 3D models, and high-level renders with um, great accuracy without putting anyone's life in risk. Um, next slide, thank you. Both JARS, Tetonics, and Tachi are perfect platforms for such a mission as they can carry payloads weighing up to 300 grams. However, the Tetonics flies for a longer, for a longer time. Um, this is a more suitable platform in the mining industry. Um, can we play the next video? Thank you. Search and rescue can occur anywhere in the world, sometimes in areas with dense terrain, lack of infrastructure, such as roads, increasing the overall resource costs. To attend to and rescue people in need in hard to reach areas with great risk is a problem that we face today. Drones with GPS and wireless connections um, can be pre-programmed to fly over highly terrain populated areas. When flying over inaccessible areas, drones can be controlled remotely, which reduces the overall human risk and attempts to access those locations. Next, thank you. The lack of infrastructure like roads is also associated with remote areas. This makes transportation from point A to B very difficult, risky, and time consuming. Drones 
use flight controllers, um, which have sensors embedded in them, just like gyroscopes, barometers, and manometers to stabilize the drone. This allows it to fly over um, areas of land with little or no infrastructure. Next, thank you. Um, in remote areas, the cost of human material resources increases significantly, sometimes due to the lack of them and sometimes due to the high risk associated with them. With the number of expert pilots capable of flying in risky areas is low, drones can be used as a cheap alternative. Next, thank you. So at JAR, we believe that our protodon can be used to achieve exactly this, which is a cheap platform for solving problems um, that can occur in um, search and rescue. So currently, JAR Aerospace is actually working to provide medical um, supplies over large areas and densely populated areas. One of the big risks in medical industry is uh, time efficiency. Fast industry, industry injuries are treated and the better there's a better survival rate as well as the faster pathologies transported there's less likely to be rejection or there's a fire, faster de diagnosis if we look at spain it's actually one of the uh, it's currently the country that donates the most organs out of any other country in the world so if we can imagine being able to transport organs from one side of the country to another or to even local countries as well so in Australia, we've got there's a currently a leading pathology company that spends eight point one million dollars on pathology transport a year. This results in over eight thousand uh, eight hundred thousand trips. So if we use one drone to transport say a hundred thousand trips um, annually, and we then times that over five years with ten drones, you can imagine how much of an is the significant efficiency that would be reduced yearly on the labor costs, as well as providing different outputs for the company. So as Marla said, the protodon is currently being used for this. Um, and she's now going to quickly go through the current case that we've got at the moment. Can we play the next video? Thank you. So we're going to use a case study to signify the use of drones and how they can benefit our lives. Here, the helicopter is representing um, a drone. Um, so let's imagine that it's 2 p.m. on a Wednesday and a patient at St. Vincent's Hospital who has been waiting on a transplant for a few months now has received a call that an organ is waiting for her at Prince of Wales Hospital, which is about 5.5 kilometers away. What you need to know about these two hospitals is that they are located in the heart of Sydney, where at 2 p.m. congestion of traffic is very likely. As you can see here with an ambulance, it would take about 35 minutes to go from Prince of Wales to St. Vincent's, but this time is significantly reduced by use of drugs. Um, so a direct flight from one hospital to another via drone reduces the chance of transplant rejection, also reduces the overall risk experienced by doctors and nurses, the patient and everyone else involved. JAR looks at problems as more of a challenge to solve than an issue. How we help people, how can we help people for the better? How can we solve problems today, make processes more efficient, and simplify lives? Go to the next slide, please. So the aerospace industry is growing. Um, while I never started in the technical field, I've been able to work within that space as well. There are multiple jobs that uh, we're looking for in the future, like IT professionals, engineers, software developers, cybersecurity experts, data analysis. Um, we need business developers and even pilots for these drones. So if that's something that you're looking at doing, I can really encourage you to look at science, technology, um, engineering, mathematics. Or if you're currently in a career and you want to change, look at certain courses that you can do outside of like coding. IOT that Cisco provides as well. So, Marla? <laughs> yeah, um, if we can go on to the next slide, please. So as Beck said, um, Cisco provides some great um, courses to kickstart the change in your career and provide the foundation for IT and software. To help you, JAR is giving away your Build Your Own Drone Kit. For anyone who completes the IOT course by the 27th of July, 2018, your name will be entered 
um, into the draw to win. Um, the draw will be announced on the 30th of July. So head down to the portal, sign up, and complete the course to win your drone. From Beck and I, on the behalf of JAR Aerospace, I want to give you a big I give a big thank you to Cisco for having us and a big thank you for everyone else listening. I'll hand over to Emma now. Great job, ladies, and very comprehensive. And I've got to say, this drone is huge at the back of these girls here. It's really quite impressive. Um, we're very short on time. I'm going to actually ask one question um, of our live audience today. I'm going to cross over firstly to Sri Lanka and then we're going to head over to the Philippines. Sri Lanka, do you have a question for our guest speakers today? Hello, I'm Shasani calling from Sri Lanka. I would like to ask, um, like, you mentioned few industries that um, the drones are broadly being used, but I would like to ask which industry do you think it would, like, benefit the most from drones? I think um, the last one, search and rescue, or just any remote area because drones are so easy to be remotely controlled with the technology that, that we have today. So personally, I would say remote areas um, for transporting medical um, things like first aid, water, medicine. Great. Thanks, Sri Lanka. Okay, we're going to cross over now to the Philippines. Philippines, are you there to join us today? Philippines? Yep, we're here. There's okay, great. Phone. Do you have a question for us, for our guest speakers? So... Sure. Um, um, regarding, regarding to the first topic that is being talked about, uh, what are the opportunities that, uh, that could be done in light of this gaming? Oh, so that question's for Jude. Jude, did you catch that? What are the opportunities in gaming right now? Oh, it's a big question. There's a lot of opportunities in gaming from um, uh, from engineering, like coding games, uh, game design, uh, art, uh, sound is big as well. Um, also, you can look at some of the kind of future platforms like um, augmented reality, virtual reality. Um, yeah, so you've got a whole broad range of different opportunities. Um, but then on the business side, you've got more kind of you know the marketing, selling. Um, how to like produce games, um, you know, looking at all the moving parts and how you bring it together. Um, yeah, and then like, so the work that we do as well on the impact side, you know, we hire, um, like we've got a head of impact. So we look at the social side as well. Um, so people who have come from the charity space, um, advertising as well is another part of gaming. Um, so we have people in our team who um, have come from advertising backgrounds or have worked with brands and agencies. Um, so there's, there's a very kind of broad um, mix of skill sets that come together um, to, to make a game. So whether it be from the pure technical side to the front end design to the business side, um, yeah, there, there's a ton of opportunities. That's great. So does that and answer the question? Yeah. I think yeah. so. Um, I do have a question that I did want to ask that's come on the social media feed, which is around um, your top games for Playmob, what is your top five games? The ones that we've worked on, or I guess that would be ones uh, in terms on of before. social good. Sorry, I forgot to put that bit in. The social, the <laughs> your top games in social good. Yeah. So um, the the top games are, are probably some that we've mentioned before. So um, uh, Dumb Ways to Kill the Ocean has been like one of the top games. That's one of our most recent ones. And uh, the reason that I would say it's one of the top games is because it's uh, been it's with an IP that's recognised. Um, so it's something that people have played before and it covers a big topic. Um, the other ocean type games have, have been very popular as well. Um, we've done work where we work within existing games. So we've worked within um, Angry Birds, uh, Plants vs Zombies, um, High School Story. Actually the High School Story campaign um, was a really, really big one because it went on for about 15 months. It raised uh, $350,000 for charity, um, but it also impacted um, millions of lives. Um, and the scenario there was it was actually a, a scenario within a game that there was millions of people playing, but the scenario was around cyberbullying. So how to teach people about how to deal with friends that are being cyberbullied or how to deal with your own <coughs> case of cyberbullying. Um, 
But what we did there was we, we planted a scenario where people can play through the different options and then they can learn where to get help. Um, and we were able to track the impact by seeing how many people would then call up the cyberbullying helpline. Um, they were getting hundreds of calls per week and we had parents writing in to say, you know, thank you for helping our child. Um, and then off that as well, we, were, um, we had a fundraiser and that's where we were able to raise $350,000 which opened up a 24-hour helpline. So that was a really successful example. Um, and also working with games like um, Hungry Shark, if anyone's played um, Hungry Shark, which is about um, sharks. Um, but we supported shark projects through Oceana, which has also raised hundreds of thousands of dollars um, to support projects. So we've done quite a lot in the ocean space, but um, I, I think that the front runner and the favourite so far has been Dumb Ways to Kill the Oceans. Yeah, and it's a hot topic right now with all the plastic yeah. issues that we've got, and it's very much a global issue. Unfortunately, yeah. that's all we have time for today. I just want to thank our speakers very much for amazing presentations, sharing your knowledge, your technology expertise. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, unfortunately, that is all we have time for. As a reminder, Jar Aerospace is donating a Make Your Own Drone Kit to be eligible. Viewers must complete the Introduction to the Internet of Things course by Friday the 27th of July. We will notify our winners via email and we will make an announcement on our Women Rock IT Facebook page on Monday the 30th of June. Um, we have posted the link for this course in the chat window. Um, if you are really uh, at that stage where you'd like to take it some look at some further courses with Cisco Networking Academy, visit our academy locator, uh, locator on www.netacad.com to find an academy near you. All presentations and recordings will be made available after the session. Please allow three working days for the presentations and the recordings to be posted up on our Women Rock IT website. Um, we look forward to you joining our new series of Women Rocket, which is commencing in October this year. So today is our final session. We will be commencing a new series in October this year. Updates um, on our website and also our Facebook page. Um, we look forward to you uh, joining our new series. Thanks and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. We really like your idea, we want to make it happen, what do you need? So it is an ultra crazy race that we're taking part in. We're all on the same team here. It's